Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our Wednesday morning Life Light Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew. It's great to have everyone here and those of you that will be watching later at home on YouTube. We always begin with a time of prayer and worship, and we are going to begin with a hymn 514, The Bridegroom Soon Will Call Us. I have this recorded, but I don't have the uh, words with it. So there'll be music, but no words, so you'll need your worship, your hymn sheet. Uh, to follow along with, okay? Good morning, Faith. Good morning. Great to have Faith here. Faith had a doctor's appointment. Well, she was excused good. for being. Will everybody get seated? Everybody tune your voices up. Oh, we can do this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Number 514, the bridegroom soon will call us. don't know that one? No. Oh, well, excellent. This is a, a great place. It wasn't, yes. it wasn't hard. I didn't That's a great hymn. It's a great hymn. So uh, 
We'll have to do that a couple more times in a setting like this so we can do it in worship. Yeah, and we'll have Dallas get up there and be the song leader. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter how well you sing it or not, the Lord loved to hear your voice. <laughs> Let's uh, now come to him in response of reading of the intro. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Look on the face of your For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself. For she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. We pray now the prayers of the church. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your word will have us focus on your return. And what we as followers of you as Christians who have been given the gift of faith, what we are responsible for and what we should do during that time will we wait your return. Open our minds and our hearts to receive your word and help us to understand it. Help us to take it to heart. But most of all, Lord, impress upon us that we are made ready by your spirit. You work in us because you love us, because you came and gave your life to make sure that we will be with you now and into eternity. We lift up these problems and concerns and petitions, Lord, and because you are our God and you are almighty, we ask you to address them according to your good and gracious will. Be with all those in our midst that need healing in our congregation. You know who they are. Apply the healing that needs needed physically, temporally, and spiritually and emotionally. Lord God, we ask that you would be with Greg and give him wisdom and leadership as he assumes a new role in his life. Be with Janice and help her to keep her medication straight and be able to care for her husband and her husband to care for her. Lord, be with Emily and the, and the family of Carol who has passed away recently. Grant them peace, grant them hope based on faith in you and the resurrection. Be with Marta who's suffering from health issues. You know what they are, Lord, and you know what needs to be done in her life. Apply healing to her life according to your good and gracious will and give her and her family patience to wait for that to happen. Be with Bonnie as she goes through the last stages of lung cancer and prepares to depart this world. Uh, we can pray for anything, Lord, so we do pray for miraculous healing. But if this be the time for her to go, take her gently. May she leave in faith towards you and be with the family as they assemble to say goodbye to her, that it would be a, a bittersweet time, yes, but a time of joyous reunion and a time to share the love that you have given us as family. Lord, we lift up Thanksgiving for Tom and Sharon's roof being done. Thank you for seeing that through and making it happen and, and making it quick and providing the materials and the men with the know-how to make that happen so quickly. Heavenly Father, be with all those who are suffering from natural disasters around the world, including the flooding that has happened here in our country and in Europe, the wildfires that are happening in the West and in Canada, all those who have lost power and had damages done to homes and businesses in the recent storms. Be with all those, Lord, uh, grant them healing, grant them recovery. Uh, be with all who step in and help them with that recovery. Be with the firefighters, protect their lives as they serve to protect others and we ask that you would bring to bear uh, their means and, and weather and rain and whatever necessary to put those fires out, Lord. And Lord, we are thankful that we have not been affected in such a way that you have protected us and just ask you would continue to protect us from these kind of disasters. 
Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grant a safe birth for Dallas's grandson. Watch over baby and mom that they might, uh, that baby might enter this world and mom be healthy and that that baby be brought under the waters of baptism. Be with Gavin as he turns five this Friday. What a blessing, Lord, uh, that you've given us him. And we ask that you would continue to watch over him and uh, may he be brought up in faith towards you. And finally, Lord, we ask that you would be with Greg and Karen as they prepare to move. Uh, not a fun thing, Lord. Uh, give them the strength physically and emotionally to be able to do that. And may that move happen safely and without any kind of damage or anything else and help them to settle into their new home. Heavenly Father, all these things we trust and trust over to you, asking you would address them each according to your love and mercy, and all God's people respond. Amen. We pray now the collect of the day. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed, we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay. So, we left off in our study guide on day three of study session seven. And the scripture we're going to look at today is Matthew 25, 1 to 13. The 25th chapter of Matthew is... Jesus telling three very unique and, and somewhat well-known parables about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, do we remember in his life what's going on at this time? Where is he and what's about to happen? Is he in the garden at this time and waiting to be arrested? He, nope. Close though. He's in Jerusalem and it is Passion Week. And uh, this would be not Thursday, which is uh, that we, we still have to do the Lord's Supper. We still have to have them gather in the upper room. So we haven't gotten there yet. This is probably Tuesday. I believe there's one day of the week that's not talked about in scripture. Could be Wednesday, but more likely this is Tuesday. And uh, Tuesday evening. So I was gonna sneeze. Uh, and so he, he has left the temple and that's, we just got done with that. Um, you see, none of these stones will stand one on top of another. Lord, when will this happen? And so he's had his uh, teaching on what's going to happen between the time he uh, ascends to the Father and the time he returns. And this is all part of that. And so this is part of that teaching where he's teaching now his disciples on what they can expect during this time until he returns. So with that, uh, we're going to watch the video representation, hopefully. Lord willing of Matthew 25, 1 to 13, and then we will read it in our Bibles. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Okay. Let's turn to our Bibles. And let's read now Matthew 25, 1, 2, 13. Okay. 
and the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were, were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flats of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealer and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay. So here Jesus is telling a parable. And what do we know about parables? What are parables? Earthly stories with heavenly meaning. Yes. Um, they help explain things that are beyond our understanding. Generally spiritual realities that can't be seen. Good. Um, one thing to caution about parables is they generally hit focus on one thing. And Jesus will often put in, he's a good storyteller. So he'll throw in um, things, details uh, that add to the story, but may not exactly have a spiritual uh, equivalent. So to sit there and pick apart every single part of it can be a dangerous thing. As you do that, you want to keep in fact, you want to keep in mind, what is the one thing that's being talked about? Uh, otherwise, you can go off into the weeds. And so we have a clue what this parable is going to be about, and it's in verse one, and it's the first one, two, three, four words, which are? Kingdom of heaven. This is about the kingdom of heaven. So it's always good to refresh our memory. What is the kingdom of heaven? Where or what is it? It's going to be with God. Mm -hmm. Part of it is the earthly church and then the heavenly congregation at the time of the resurrection. Part of it. Problem is we don't think about kings and kingdoms anymore, do we? And when we think of kingdoms, we think of somebody who rules, right? And they rule over a certain territory. If we had a king, he would be the king of the United States and his kingdom would be the continental United States and if he's strong enough, why? But um, a better way to look at kingdoms, at least putting it back into context then, is reign and rule. The kingdom is where the king reigns and rules. So we're talking about where God reigns and rules. And should we think of that in any kind of a, just an earthly location or a spatial location? No. No, because God reigns and rules everywhere. But now we have Jesus, one of his messages was he was bringing the kingdom. The kingdom was coming with him. And in that, what do you think that means, that the reign and rule of God was coming with Jesus? Where was that reign and rule coming and where was it expanding to with Jesus coming and all that he did and said? Did Jesus say that the kingdom of God is with, within you? Is that the word? Yeah. So, Karen? Among you? The reign and rule of God is in you, and it's in me, and it's in each one of you, and it's among us, it is. So it's Christ coming into our hearts and ruling by faith. And that's because he comes not just a savior, but he comes as Lord. He comes as a king. He comes to rule. And so the coming of the kingdom, and even in the, the uh, uh, our Father, uh, the Lord's Prayer, May your kingdom come. We're talking about that reign and rule coming not only into our hearts, but into the hearts of all that we witness to, that that reign and rule might be established in their hearts. 
Now, he doesn't just rule there. Where else does the Lord reign and rule? Whole world. Everywhere. The thing is, it's not seen. He reigns and rules, and it's invisible. It's hidden. It's a better way to put it. So even though all kinds of nasty and bad things happen, the Lord is still reigning and ruling over this whole entire earth. And everything that happens is known by him and used by him. And so on the final day, what will happen to God's reign and rule? Will it still be hidden on the last day? No. It'll explode. And it'll be seen and it'll be visible everywhere. And the usurpers of power, which is the devil and his demons, will be gone. So that's the best way to look at God's reign and rule. And so we're talking about how that reign and rule, what we need to know about it in this time now, in between the time Christ ascended and returns, what it'll be like looking forward to that last day when it will be the total reality of everything, okay? Um, so let's look at this parable now in, in that regard. Um, who is the bridegroom in the parable? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, yeah. And we see that a lot in other things we've studied, right? He's always the bride, bridegroom, and that makes us bride. the bride. In this parable, we have 10 virgins. Who are they? Us. Yeah. Not just us. They're the visible church. Now, I say visible church. Does anybody know why I designate visible church? Because what else is there? In the invisible church. Yeah, excellent. Were we, is that what you were going to say? Okay. Okay, so what's the difference? How does the invisible church differ from the visible church? The, in, the invisible church is the true believers. They're not the ones that are invisible, that can cloak themselves and sneak. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. You're right. Yeah, they're invisible. Why? Why, why are the true believers invisible, Tom? Because you can't read the heart of another man. Excellent. But, but when, when one enters the church on Sunday morning, not just this church, but any church, you can look around and you can say, oh, the members are here. But it, you can't tell who the real believers are. That's true. So you mean on a Sunday morning as I look out, not everybody believes in Jesus? Not everybody believes in Jesus. Exactly. So then what do I need to make sure I preach every Sunday? The gospel message. Even though people roll their eyes and look away and the chairman of the congregation looks at his watch? <laughs> I don't know who exactly that is, but yeah, I it, it needs... Watch, watch anymore, so I just look at my phone. It needs to be preached every Sunday because there's people there that need to hear it. And only the Holy Spirit knows when it might hit home. Now, a pastor, and I, I endeavor to try to fit that gospel message into whatever the overarching theme of the service is, or to not say the same thing over and over. Uh, but even that, I'm human. But that's why every single time it needs to be preached. And I believe, and I don't, not all uh, pastors do this. I, I believe we need to talk about the cross and the resurrection every Sunday. I know sometimes it's alluded to, but I find it important that you need to hear Christ died for your sins. And if, if I'm talking about a particular sin, that he took care of that particular sin that we've been talking about. But I think that's highly important for that very reason, because there's people out there, they may need to hear it. So good. Um, so we have 10 versions, five, five are wise, five are foolish. So the five wise ones are who? True believers. The, true believers. the invisible church. And that makes the five foolish. Invisible. They're here. Do they maybe think that their future is eternal life? Yes. Maybe. Are they trusting in Christ to get there? No. No. But they're in the church. And kind of the idea here is once upon a time, they may have been members of the invisible church, but something happened and they've fallen away. What we believe in baptism, everybody on your baptism is made a member of the invisible church. For some, that faith is not kept active. 
All right, and then we've got the oil. What is the oil? Gospel. Anything else? That's the Holy Spirit. It's and this is another one where you don't want to be too general is good for oil. Uh, and this comes from a commentary because I struggle with this too. Oil is whatever you need to stay in a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. So all of your answers are right. We need the Holy Spirit, we need God's word, we need the sacraments. We need to confess our sins, repent, and receive uh, the absolution. We need to receive the Lord's Supper. We need to be in fellowship with one another, building each other up in faith. All of those things. All of the ways and means that the Holy Spirit uses to keep us in a faith relationship with Christ could be called the oil. Uh, before we get started actually into the questions, another thing, and this comes from... Uh, uh, the Concordia commentary on Matthew is really good. Uh, it's written by Jeffrey Gibbs, and it's good because he's a uh, St. Louis professor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Got to have pride in your seminary. No, he is really good. And it's, it's uh, if you're ever interested, it's not a real hard read. Um, you probably want to skip over all the Greek stuff, but he does a real good job of actually explaining things. And this is his point. And I, I've heard this before, and it's stuck with me from a class I had with him. We don't know all of the details of Jewish life. And one of the things we don't have 100% complete information on is marriage customs. And you can't look at how they do marriage today because there's so much time that has passed by. And we do know there's a lot of things that they celebrate now that are not true to the time of Jesus or before. Jesus also, during his parables, tends to throw in a monkey wrench in them something that you wouldn't expect. So if I was telling you a story about a farmer who got on his uh, machine and, and started to uh, glean his fields and all of a sudden it took off and started to fly. Well, all of a sudden now you're looking at me, right? That's not a detail you expected for a farmer. And that's a little bit outrageous, but Jesus will sometimes throw in an unexpected detail. And, and for the people that were listening, that would, your attention now is focused on this, why? Why is this happening? This doesn't normally happen. And so we're not exactly sure where that is in the parable. As we go through, we can make a couple ideas and suggestions to it, okay? I, I wanna read one other thing and it's from our Lutheran study Bible and it's uh, about, uh, it's from a page, talks about family life in Israel. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do know about Israel like marriage customs. Marriage, the foundation of family in all cultures, appears quite different in the Bible than it does for people today. Western marriage customs owe more to ancient Rome than to ancient Israel. For example, June, named after Juno, the Roman queen of heaven and goddess of for, for, for femininity in marriage, was for Romans the most popular month for marriages. I think that's probably true in our culture, isn't it? The exchange of rings is not biblical, but Roman. When a young woman and her family accepted a man's offer of marriage, she would receive gifts and a ring for the third finger of her left hand. The joining of right hands and kissing go back to the Romans, not the Bible. Even holding marriage ceremonies in a place of worship where the exchange of vows goes back to Rome, not to the biblical customs. Not that any of these are wrong, but that's just not how Israel celebrated it. Parents almost always arranged marriages in ancient Israel uh, Abraham arranged for the marriage of, marriage of Isaac. When Isaac's son Jacob left home, Isaac emphasized the importance of marrying within his own clan or tribe. He said, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Take as your wife one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Although we might find the practice of arranged marriages odd or even cold. In fact, such marriages often lead to love. This is what could be expected since loving parents would choose the best spouse for their child. In Isaac's case, we read, Rebecca became his wife and he loved her. But love came after the marriage. Courtship or marriage on the basis of love was not a part of normal life in the time of the patriarchs. Parents from different families did not leave boys and girls alone together. However, young people might meet in the early morning or the late afternoon when girls went to the village to get water from their family, from the well for their families. Although many of the patriarchs married late in life, it was common for people to marry in their mid-teens. 
Now, isn't that something that's very wise? They didn't let young men and young women be alone together because young men and young women in their teens, what's going on with them? Hormones. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Marriage is a contract. The contract of marriage or betrothal was as binding as marriage itself. Once the families agreed on that commitment, the couple was considered married. The New Testament story of Joseph and Mary provides an example of this. Although they were only pledged to be married, Joseph would have to divorce Mary to break off the relationship. Ancient Israelites also uh, had a practice called mohar, that is a price paid to the bride's father to compensate him for the loss of his daughter. The common fee was 50 silver shekels, but in some case, the mohar was not paid in money. For example, Jacob exchanged 14 years of later to labor to obtain Leah and Rachel from their father Laban. On the occasion, the bride would receive some of the mohar as a gift from his parents, from the parents. This was called matin or dowry. Israelite weddings. On the wedding day, the bridegroom would dress in wedding garments and his friend would escort him to the house of the bride. The bride would come out to meet him with her friends. The Song of Solomon beautifully depicts the wedding procession and the meeting of the bride and the groom. This is the context of the parable of the 10 virgins. And what you have going on here is kind of the basis for what we would call a parade. It was a parade. It was public. And if it was at night, you needed those lamps, those torches to be lighted, not just so people could see the way, although you needed that because there was no outdoor lighting, even in the city. It was part of the joyous celebration of it, and it garnered the attention of the people in the city surrounding saying, hey, Tom's son's getting married. Let's go. Let's be part of this, because it was a huge celebration. It was a great, grand event. The whole group would joyously parade to the home that the groom had prepared. Jesus uses this imagery to describe his relationship with the church when he says, in my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. The Christian life is like a betrothal. Heaven will be like marriage. Interesting, isn't it? And that's part of that prepare a place. Before, when that was what the betrothal period was. It was for several different reasons. One was to give the uh, groom time to go build a house. Or he, perhaps he would build a room onto his father's house, but a place where they could live. And the other part was to wait at least nine months to make sure that girl wasn't pregnant. And then you knew that she was truly a virgin and she was yours. Whereas marriage in the patriarchal period would have been arranged by oral agreement, later in Israelite history, the father of the two families and the groom would sign a marriage document. The couple would drink wine from a common cup to seal the marriage covenant and to signify the joy of their new life together. This may have taken place under a marriage canopy called a chupa. The term occurs in uh, Joel 2.16, where it's translated as chamber. A week-long marriage feast often followed the ceremony. The meals were as elaborate as the family could afford. And that's you can see that when you remember Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. It lasted more than one day. And, and during that week-long festival, what happened? Wine ran out and Jesus created more. And so how does Jesus feel about marriage? How does he feel about celebrating marriage? He approves strongly. Yes. In some of these ancient customs, we might trace present day practices. Through though customs come and go, God's ideal remains constant. Based on creation and union of Adam and Eve in Eden, the essence of marriage remains the same. It is a commitment wherein a man and a woman become one. So, with that in mind, let's look at our parable about the wise and the foolish virgins. And uh, we'll go to our study guide. Any questions on any of that as we prepare to turn to our study guide? Like Good, because I don't have much more to ask. <laughs> I like the, uh, the insight that provided uh, that ties in in St. John that I go to prepare a place for you. I never thought of it in, in conjunction with the parable. Yeah, which, which you know, yeah. some people interpret that go to prepare a place for you is him ascending to the Father. Mm -hmm. No, he prepared a place for you on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's where he built a room for you, set aside a room for you. 
And he came back in the resurrection, but he truly will come back on the last day. And that's when we get to enjoy that room in eternal life with him. Anything else? Reading from our uh, study guide. Jesus uses three more illustrations in chapter 25 to teach his disciples that the end is near. So we've got this parable, uh, we've got the parable of the talents, and then we've got the parable of the white throne of judgment. So Jesus is laying it to him. This is his last chance to teach him because a world of hurt is going to open up and things are going to be confused and he's going to be arrested and the disciples are going to freak out and leave. And so now is his final chance to impress upon them what they need to know. So he uses three uh, illustrations, parables to do that. Jesus calls for serious preparation and responsible action. In today's reading, we consider the parable of the 10 virgins. This parable reflects the life and everyday customs of the people among whom Jesus lived. The virgins in this text are bridesmaids in a wedding party, responsible for preparing the bride to meet her bridegroom. An exact time for the wedding ceremony was not set. It was customary for the bridegroom to arrive unexpectedly to fetch his bride, although he was required to send someone along the street to announce his arrival. Since this might happen at any time, the bridal party had to be ready and waiting. When the cry came, they would go out into the street to meet the bridegroom. Then the wedding couple would be escorted in a sea of lights to the home of the bridegroom's father, where the ceremony was performed and refreshment provided. Once the door had been shut, late comers were not admitted. Now they have that in the study guide. I don't know that that's a verifiable custom in Jewish time. Latecomers not allowed. I don't know that. So as we're looking for what might be this twist in the plot, that's possibly one. And it would make sense according to what Jesus is trying to communicate to us. Read verses 1 through 4. Somebody want to go back and read that in our uh, reading, Matthew 25, 1 through 4? And the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps, and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamp, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So what distinguishes the foolish girls from the wise? The wise ones came prepared. Mm -hmm. Prepared by bringing along extra oil. And the foolish? They just went along for the ride. They showed up. They showed up without. Um, and, you know, the, the parable doesn't really explain, but what might be some reasons? And we are thinking about how this translates into the spiritual. What may be some of the reasons why they didn't prepare? Why they didn't bring extra oil? Well, they thought they had enough. And why would that be? They don't plan for anything. Yeah, so they thought they'd come early. Yeah. And, and that's very appropriate, especially for this time, because even in the early church, they expected Jesus would return in their lifetime. And, and sometimes you can see a little bit of that in Paul's writing, like maybe he thought so too, but he wasn't quite sure. Well, that didn't come to be. Did it? So they didn't expect it to be that long. And we don't really know the, the, the kind of lamps are not really described and there's two there's two types of lamps they could have one is more like a torch which would be a stick with some kind of cloth wrapped around it and you would dip it in oil and it would burn but more than likely these are lamps that have a reservoir in them because they would burn longer so these if that's the case these women brought the lamp that had some oil in it but they didn't have any extra to put in it they didn't have enough money to buy more oil that would be going a little bit beyond the, the parable. Plus, what happens? Do they actually go and get oil? Yeah. yeah. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. They it's do. too late. It's too late. Yeah. What's interesting about that is, though, here they are, they're standing with lamps, and the lamps are burning, and all of a sudden they realize that they're going to run out. So then they run down to the corner store, and it's dark. Where do you think that might, to me it could have been the store is closed in the maybe? I was thinking, it was, I was thinking that same thing about it was midnight. 
yeah. you know. Good points, but once again, I think now we're we're, we're picking, picking apart the details too much, because uh, Jesus does indicate, or at least it seems to indicate, that they were able to get more oil. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about what. Go ahead, Jill. I'm sorry. I was going to say maybe the point there is the fact that it was dark and they needed the lamps. Yes, it is. It was dark and they needed the lamps. And uh, how easy would it be to go and get more oil when your lamps had gone out? Even if even if the place to get more oil was close, can you go as fast as you need to? No, 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 you can't. Um, so we'll we'll get back to um, that getting more oil thing in, in just a bit. Uh, going on, any other comments or questions up until this point, though? You're all doing really well. You're all right on track here with this parable. Uh, number twelve. Read verses five to six, and as you do so, imagine the excitement in the bride's house as the girls wait for the moment when the bridegroom will arrive. Read verses five to six, somebody. The bridegroom was long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. What might account for their falling asleep? Because who fell asleep? All of them. Wise and foolish, didn't they? Why? Why the did they fall asleep? Late. It was late. Yep. The hour was late. The hour was late. And, and they weren't uh, sure when it would happen. Yeah. And when it's late and we're waiting, what happens to us? You get sleepy. Fall asleep. yeah. Natural thing, isn't it? So that helps us kind of explain why maybe the foolish ones didn't take oil with them. They didn't realize that it was going to be that late at night and that it was going to be that long and having extra oil would be that important. And so you get the idea that all of their lamps were burning, yet they fell asleep. And what happened when they fell asleep? Their lamps went out. All of their lamps go out which is to be expected. They burned through the oil that was in the reservoir of their lamps. Questions or comments so far? So it's natural. I mean, falling asleep, don't look at that as falling out of faith necessarily. Falling asleep would be when you're asleep, you're no longer watching for the coming of the bridegroom. Yet what happens? How come how come they're able to wake up and light their lamps again? Because somebody's outside calling a bunch of racket and beating on drum or whatever. And, and in that respect, we, we are not going to miss Jesus' return. And that's because he loves you so very much and wants to make sure you are with him. He has parables like this and broken sinful people like me to keep preaching on the resurrection and judgment day to wake us up. Question 13. Read verses 7 to 11. Somebody want to do that? And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay. So, how would you expect the foolish girls to feel as they see their lamps fading? Panic. <laughs> What's that, Jill? Panic. <laughs> yeah. In, in the Greek, you really get the idea of they all were able to light their lamps. It's just the ones that had no oil. And you, perhaps you've seen this in a Coleman lantern. 
when you're out of oil, you may be able to light it because there's residual propane in there, but then it immediately goes, up, goes out. So you light it. Okay, that's good, but it's not good because it goes out and now it won't relight because you're out of oil. There'd be panic. How about what else? Because what's about to happen? Is it, is it an important event? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say an element of fear, maybe? Yeah. Anxiousness. Yeah. How would you feel if you if it's if you realize because it's you neglected to bring oil? How would you feel? Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Good. Maybe even foolish because you <laughs> yeah. Disappointed. Mm -hmm. Guilty. Once the door is shut, I would probably be like, it's not fair. And that's another thing. We see we don't know that yet. Right. And perhaps they didn't even realize that that was going to happen because that very well could be the twist and plot we're talking about. The other one also could be the lateness of the hour. That could have been something that everybody go, wait a minute. He was delayed that long. He was coming that late. And is it a point Jesus wants to make? Does that fit with what this parable is talking about? Yes. We don't know the hour. We don't know when he's coming. And Jesus wants to impress upon us, the church, that it's going to be a long time. Long enough that some people might not only fall asleep, but their lamps might go out and they'll have nothing to start them. It could be long enough so that the unfaithful may come to faith. What was that, Ron? That the unfaithful may come to faith. It would be long enough that... Well, that's yeah. the reason why he delays. Yeah. But what happens, what can happen during that time to the faithful? Right. Gee, they quit coming to church and they quit doing Bible study. And... Yeah. Do you know that the, the Greek word for foolish that's used here is moros? And it's we get an English word from that. Anybody want to guess what it is? Moros? Moros? Take the S off and put an N. Moron? Yes. That's how foolish they are. That's the comment on this. Those that are not prepared for the bridegroom to, to come are morons because it's their fault. It's their fault that they run out of oil. It's not that anybody withheld the oil, because what did we say the oil was? Not just the gospel, but it was everything we need to stay in a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. How often are you provided with everything you need to stay in a faith relationship with Christ? Almost every day. Yes. Definitely every Sunday morning, and you get it over and over again in the worship service. It comes at the beginning, the middle, and the end through the readings, through the confession and absolution, through the hymns, through the sermon, and big time through the sacrament. And so those who are morons, as Faith said, what are they doing? Not partaking of worship I don't, or Bible study. Or, I, I, yeah. I, but I, I believe in God. Yeah. I, I, I watched last week. I don't need to watch this week. I, I'd rather sleep in. I'd rather go golfing. I'd rather go swimming. I'd rather do this. I'd rather do that. I got to mow my yard. I got to do this. I got to do that. And surely missing one worship service, will that cause your oil to dissipate? No, No, but missing no. it the next week and then the next week and then the next week because you have 50 million excuses not to go. It's the only day I can sleep in. I've been so busy this week. And during that time, I think it might also affect our worship at home during the week as far as prayers or daily devotions or reading. Very good. That's not a natural thing for us, is it? No. No. It's a habit, and it's an easy habit to get out of. And those are all ways that we keep our oil supply. And who's actually doing that? It's not so much us. Who's doing that? The devil. No. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is keeping our, us well supplied in oil. And what we do is we 
take away the opportunities and the means that he uses to do that. I think another thing is the more that we know of the word as far as the content, but also memorizing, the more the Holy Spirit can bring that to mind wherever we are. Yeah. So you can drive in the car. It wouldn't be good to have the Bible on the steering wheel, would it? No. 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 But if you know scripture, you can be on a long drive thinking about that. Or one of my favorite things, you want to have help with prayer? Pray uh, the Lord's Prayer through, petition by petition. Our Father who art in heaven, you're my Father. You rule over all things, and I can call you my loving Father. So I should hallow your name. I should bless your name through my words and my head and my mouth and my heart and my life. And just, you understand? Take it off from there. And there are times when you really, you know, you might struggle with what to pray for. But could you do that while you're driving in the car? Could you do that in the waiting room, waiting for the doctors? Yeah. yeah. Could you do that as you're falling asleep? Yeah. 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 Very good. Holy Spirit is the one and what people, and here's the other thing. We, all of us can develop bad habits, me included, where we miss opportunities to have our oil rejuvenated. We all do. Um, but thank God who's working on the other side of that. Well, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so he's the one that, Maybe he says to me, you know what? How long has it been since you sat down and prayed? Pastor Mark, you've got this prayer list in front of you day by day by day. Did you do that yesterday? Did you do that the day before? Or I'll hear somebody talk about, I'll pray for you. And there's somebody that's on my prayer list. And I'm like, oh, darn it all. I could have told you I prayed for you yesterday because you're on there. But I didn't. So you have those little reminders. But what else does the Holy Spirit do to keep us honest and keep us in the word? Something he allows. You're talking about that about um, troubles to come. That would be <laughs> say it again, please. That about troubles to come. He allows bad things to happen to good people. Sometimes they're things that are consequences for our sin. Sometimes they're not. But those things, what do they do when trouble comes? Does it drive us back to him? To his word on our knees in prayer and even back into worship because we know we'll find him there and we can sing to him and we can pray to him and he'll he's actually physically present in a way that he's not anywhere else those are all so those are blessings in disguises aren't they any other comments on on, on what we're talking about here or questions Looking at you, Jill. What's on that pad? <laughs> Nothing. You're answering most of it. I was just thinking of what Gary says with can't fix stupid. Yes. <laughs> Great Gary quote. <laughs> Gary, Gary, and our, this is an often quote from him at our 7 p.m. Wednesday Bible study. You can't fix stupid. <laughs> or you can't fix morons. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can. So that leads us into something we need to talk about next. And uh, well, the question B uh, from 13, what false assumption did the five foolish make? That the wise would give them oil. That they didn't need any extra oil or that they could get some. I don't even know if they went that far, really. I don't think, I think I go along over the lines that they didn't expect the wait to be that long. What's in their lamp was enough. And especially if it wasn't common to wait that long, why would they worry? And some people are just the type that are never prepared for mm -hmm. anything. It's like, hey, we got to go. Hey, here's, a, here's my lamp. They didn't even check to see how much was in it. They just took it because there yeah. was some oil in it. And let's go. They checked their gas gauge. That's what I was thinking. Right. Yeah. Just, for, just for gas in the car yesterday. They must have been. Parents were told to check that lamp because you're All right. Th those of you, how many of you have had children get married? All right. Children get married. 
How, how long did you plan ahead for that event? And what did you do to plan for it? Months. <laughs> Months. Did you have your clothes picked out that you're going to wear? No. You didn't the day before the wedding? You didn't have your clothes picked out? Oh, the day before, yeah. Yeah. So you were prepared for it, right? You made sure that there was gas in the car that time, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You knew what you were going to wear. You were dressed and ready. Your makeup is on. You know where it's going to be, right? You've got your map or you got it programmed into your... Why, why would you do all that? Would you normally do that if you were just going out to breakfast the next morning? No. No, but I usually make sure I got money to pay for it. <laughs> that's always good. Well, so that's a good idea. And, and, and you want to make sure you know you're at the wedding on time. Yeah, what time, how long it takes to get there. Why do all this when you wouldn't normally do it when you were just going off to go shopping or go to breakfast? How important was this wedding ceremony? Very important. Very important. So even though there's people that normally don't prepare, if it's a big thing, only a moron would prepare for this wedding ceremony. All right? And, and we know the wedding ceremony spiritually. What does that mean? We're preparing. No, what is the wedding ceremony in this parable? What is Jesus referring to? eternal life is there anything more important than eternal life nope. preparing for eternal life is that more important than your golf date yeah. and getting your grass mowed than fixing your house than even going out to breakfast with your family it's all pretty important and if you miss one Sunday I'm not saying you're no longer going to eternal life, but there's that habit thing. You always want to keep that in your head. It's a lot easier to miss the next time around. And that's what was so bad about the COVID is that some got out of the habit. Yes, some got out of the habit and, and they still aren't back into it yet. Tom? Just going back to what Karen alluded to about the gas situation. How often is it? I've said it and it is kind of dumb. I know my car, even at a quarter of a tank, we have more than enough gas. Um, have parents, Sounds like yeah, and then you get stuck in a traffic jam for three hours and you run out of gas. Right? She always told me she wasn't going to go get gas. <laughs> no. It, it makes it a lot easier because I mean the flex has that tells you how many miles to empty. Yeah. Taurus doesn't do that. And in fact, the closer it gets at below a quarter of a tank, it's always floating up and down. It'll drop down to E and then it'll go back up. But I my dad told me once he was mad when I brought the car home and it it had less than a quarter of a tank. You never you never leave it at a quarter of a tank. You always want to top it up, up by that. And it's a great point. So um, let's let's move on to uh, question C. Note verse nine. But the wise answered, saying, "Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves." How does that sound to you as a Christian? In a sense, it almost sounds mean, but it does, doesn't it? But sometimes it's like, as a parent, you can't take care of everything for your kid nope. because then they don't learn to take care of themselves. And it wasn't their fault that they didn't bring enough oil. And it wasn't that they didn't have opportunity to apply. Exactly. But this is really important. I mean, you you might do that to teach your kids a lesson. But, but if you're taking off and flying across country on a trip to Europe and they weren't ready in the morning, are you going to leave them there? Especially no, if they're little? But they might have to go in pajamas. Right. But you're going to take them. So this is a huge thing. But they and, weren't and, children. And the, and the wise are not going to share their oil. The wise, they're the Christians. They're the believers in Jesus. And we know Jesus preaches that we are supposed to be sacrificial in our love of others, to give until it hurts and then beyond. So here's a point that really garners our attention, isn't it? They don't share. 
And I think that should bother us and make us stop and think. Well, you can at the end. It, it, at that point, it was at the end. So you don't want to make excuses for Jesus or for the story. Let it stand out and let it hurt and then move on, okay? It's a big thing. Now, let's talk about some reasons as to why they may not. What do they say? What reason do they give? We may not have enough. We may not have enough for us. If, if they share and then the wise run out of oil, are the foolish probably going to run out of oil too? Yeah. Right. So everybody Nobody has oil. And it does seem a little bit personal. Okay, well, now they're worried about missing the thing too. But keep in mind, this is a parade. This is a joyous thing. You want people with lamps lit to join you in the parade throughout town to garner everybody's attention so people will join them and be part of the wedding feast, which is usually for the whole town. So if their lamps go out, it affects not just them. It's kind of a sign of disrespect to the bride and groom. Now this parade, which celebrates their upcoming union, is now kind of squelched, isn't it? So there's kind of a good reason why they don't want to share. They don't want everybody's oil to go out. Now let's transfer this into the spiritual realm. We know that the oil is everything or anything that it takes for us to stay in a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Tom, can, how much of that can I share with you? I can share the gospel. I can share my witness with you. Can I make you believe? No. If you're resistant to even hear what I have to say, or come to the place of worship that I go to to be built up by the Holy Spirit. Not much I can do to that, is there? And so what it takes for you to stay in a faith relationship with Jesus is up to you personally. And this, in my mind, really speaks to those that say, well, my wife goes. I'm fine. She takes care of the church. And I don't need to worry about that. She represents the family. That doesn't cut it, does it? No. And uh, that's what it gets me. And this is this is a serious twist. They ran out of oil, and there's no one that can help them. And when you think about it, if this is the bridegroom coming, this is Jesus' return on the last day. When he returns, you won't have time to go get oil. You won't have time to page through your Bible and look for John 3.16 or to go find a Christian and ask them to preach the gospel to you. It's too late. And grace is gone. And the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion is done. The door was closed. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's coming okay. up. If being, this is D, if being prepared for Jesus coming means being in a faith relationship with him, how can your faith be nourished so it grows and remains strong until that unknown day or hour of Jesus' return? Word and sacrament. And I always bring this up too. I mean, it's, I, you should. Worship, if you're on vacation, find a place to worship or stream us or sit around and have your own worship service. The, catechism, the small catechism has a nice little short abbreviated worship service in it. Do something. I, I really, you know, streaming is great, but if you're on vacation and you can attend an LCMS church and be there live in person, I would say do that. And then watch us. <laughs> but I, I yeah, I mean, because it's, you, you, Jesus, yes, he's present, but he's not present in the same way. You go to an LCMS church that's giving the sacrament. He's present in a way that he's not present when you're watching on the live stream, at least in a way that's not promised through that. 
But then once again, that's, well, for us, it's an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. Is that enough? Think about what bombards you the rest of the week. Devil's really busy, especially now. All kinds of crap and all kinds of reasons to doubt and be anxious. And, and all the things that are going on in the world, as Ron said, there seems to be, or was it Tom, all kinds of natural disasters. It's a very, very hard time to live in, isn't it? There, it's a time for us to be anxious. I, sometimes I wonder about all the natural disasters, not that they're not happening, but it's like, I think they've happened like this in cycles. It's just that we hear about everything now. It's instant yeah. news, instantly. Yeah, but the thing is, is that that cycle is broader. That's, if there's natural disasters today, what are those same natural disasters going to be in five years or six years before eternity? And I'm not saying that we're even close to the end days, but it's, it's bad today, what's it going to be like tomorrow? That was Al's point uh, two weeks ago, that uh, due, due to uh, the easy access of communication and the internet, we can know what's going on half a world away instantaneously as it happens, where it would have taken a long time for that news to travel to us. And, and even right now, sex and violence sells. So any natural disaster or anything that's going on is going to be front page of the news and because it sells. That's what people want to see. Like a lot of times it, it, it would happen, but you, it would be such a small blurb you didn't even realize it was going on someplace else. But and, like right now, it's like everything that's going on, they just blast you with it. And especially uh, unrest of the cities and violence and shootings, because that's a major news story. So you're hearing about every single thing that's happening where you might not have heard it in white, other times when other things are going on in the news, uh, like when Trump was president and he was speaking out of his rear end. And, <laughs> he did. I mean, I, whether you were supportive or not, uh, there was times I wish he would just shut up. Somebody would take his phone away. But that was a news story. That was what was the focus was at that time. Were people being killed in the cities? Were gangs yeah. at work? Yeah. Heck yeah, they were. You didn't hear about them because they were busy covering other things, Tom. I was just going to... The, the thought of it is, and, and I'll go along with faith on this, if you compare what's going on in the city of Flint to what has been going on in Chicago, the death rate in Chicago is just, it's astronomical. I mean, they, they even quit reporting, they quit reporting on the numbers. Well, but if you look at the amount of people that live in the city of Flint compared to Chicago, we're probably right up there. Population wise. Well, that's Population the other point though. Wise. We're hearing more on the news of what's happening, but yes, the violence and the gang related shootings and all of that is increasing. Per capita, it's increasing. The, the strength and the damage of the storms that are coming through are increasing and the frequency. It's not just that we're hearing about stuff we wouldn't hear before. The actual events are getting worse, and that's all biblical, and that's going to continue. And I don't care what kind of new green deal you pass or what you do to the ozone layer. Or to It's going to continue to get worse because Jesus said it would. Tom. And I, again, I'll, I'll just say, as these things increase our faith should decrease i'm not sure if it should get to a higher level but at least we should be able to look at it and say man this is what's going to happen this is what's happening and you main, maintain your faith and 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 keep feeding it yeah we, we can look at each of these things as an affirmation that what Jesus said is coming true. And if all these things are coming true, then the thing we hang most securely on, that he will return, and all of this will be done with, that will most certainly happen. And the proof of that is each and everything that he said would happen, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, floods, violence, the hearts of many growing cold. As all that occurs, Jesus' promise of return is even more sure and certain. 
And we really have to buy into the statement that Jesus made on the cross. It is finished. Everything about salvation has been done. So what we are experiencing, that part, we're going to get past that. The, uh, I, I know I said this before, but it's, it's, it's great comfort to me. And Jesus' final word, it is finished, is one Greek word. It's called telestai. And it comes from the business world. If I was selling something to Faith and she paid me the amount that she owed me, I would stamp telestai on her bill. It is finished. It is completely paid for. Nothing else is owed. And so on the cross, when Jesus said it was finished, he told you, you owe the Heavenly Father nothing more for your sins. They are completely paid for. And that is such a beautiful word for us. And how do you know that's true? The Holy Spirit works in you. The resurrection. The Spirit pointing to the resurrection. The fact that he rose again from the grave, that payment was accepted by the Heavenly Father and you are, and you do stand in righteousness because of him. Good stuff. Any other comments? So the wise girl's comment does seem somewhat cruel, but it's just reality. And they're not completely cruel. They don't say, well, just go off, get out of here. Go find some more oil. Maybe, maybe there's time, but we know there's not. Uh, 14, read verses 12 to 13. Somebody want to do those? Read those verses again. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. So here we have going back a little bit. Uh, actually, we should have... Uh, Went back and did. afterwards the other virgins came also so they came to the door of the feast probably they had oil they came but it's late saying lord lord open to us but he answered truly i say to you i do not know you watch out therefore for you do not know the day or the hour uh, our question is would you what would you how would you expect the five foolish girls to accept the finality of the bridegroom's decision Do you think possibly they expected that they would be let in even though they were late? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what I was thinking. It's not fair if I were in that position. Yeah. Um, because it's always, I don't know, I think, it's, I think it's our nature, my nature at least, to put the problem on somebody, you know, somebody else's fault. It was not my responsibility. That's a great point. And we come from a place of grace, right? It's always mm -hmm. grace. We don't lock people out that are late to worship. No. We don't ask them for a reason. This is different, though. And I think if there's a point in the story that stands out that is not appropriate with culture, I think maybe it was this one. I think this might have shocked them because even if you're late, they're going to let you in. I mean, it's it's a week-long festival. It just keeps going. But not this one. Let's take it from the parable story to the spiritual reality. What's the spiritual reality here of these five foolish versions not being able to get in to the wedding feast? They've come to the realization that they're on the outside. And they're going to stay on the outside. Why are they on the outside? Because they weren't they were prepared. prepared. They weren't prepared. They didn't listen. Weren't prepared when? What was the big moment that they weren't prepared for? The bridegroom could right. come. Right. And to be at their death, at their death, that's the nurse. Or their death. Very good, Norma. Yes, that too. Do we know when that day will be? No. And Satan would like us to believe, I think, that don't worry, there's lots of time. Oh, yeah. Definitely. We can do that later. Definitely. So have fun now. Right. Eat, drink, and be married. 
On my deathbed, I'll turn back to God. But you may not have time on that deathbed. Or can I turn back in faith on my own? No. No. Be drawn. No. Even if I remember that I went to church and I remember that thing about Jesus dying for sins, I might remember it, but I don't believe it. I don't trust in it. And when you're facing death and it's coming. You need to already be in faith and trusting. That's not a time where you can make a lot of those kind of decisions. And we know you can't. You can't choose. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. You can say the words, but that doesn't do it. I guess the thing is, when you're talking to people who were brought up in the church and then they no longer come, and they'll say, well, I believe in God. Well, do you? You know about God. Most most people know about God, but believing is a different thing than knowing. Believing it's includes action. trusting, in trusting your life, and if your, you, if everything you, you have to that what you believe in. To, in this case, to Jesus, right? If you believe and trust in God, then why wouldn't you go to church? Why wouldn't you go to a Bible study? Coming up, we'll, we'll read through James in our epistle lessons. What does James say about faith? Without faith without works is? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not really faith, is it? You can have faith in a number of things. Well, and they might say, well, I do this and I do that. You know, I donate to the poor. I don't do that, you know. But that's not, the, that's not what he's talking about, faith without works is dead. Just I because you do, works. yeah. I can have faith that this computer is going to work and through the process of Zoom, I can talk to Jill at home. Is that faith going to save me? No. No. I mean, I, it, it is faith because I'm not really sure. I don't know how the computer works. And in <laughs> fact, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> so I am entrusting it to something that I can't necessarily see, touch, taste, or feel, but it's not, doesn't save me. And so that's it. Who, who are you putting your trust in? That's the faith that we were talking about. It has to be in Christ. And, and faith in Jesus is not just as Savior, but it's as Lord, who tells you to worship him, who tells you to pray to him, who tells you to use the means of grace. And you, we all occasionally say no, but somebody who's fallen out of faith continually says, nope, not today, not for me, not right now. So how do these foolish girls feel when they knock on the door and the bride won't let them in? Or the groom won't let them in? They feel foolish. Foolish? They're angry. Angry? What else? Hopeless. Hopeless because now translated over into the spiritual reality. You're standing on the verge of eternal life and you're told no. Well, you're gonna have it, but not in heaven. At this point. So how do you feel? At this point, they're accountable. Huh? At this point, they're accountable. They're feeling accountable for the first time. For, yeah, possibly the first time ever. Mm -hmm. I think Norma hit the nail on the head, hopeless. Mm -hmm. Imagine the degree of hopeless to know that not only are you locked out now, but you're locked out forever. And that you will spend forever in the place where Jesus, to say it in this one here, I'll hear you all in the next parable. Weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. How bad is it now? Have you ever, you ever arrived someplace and not been able to get in? You, you, they've told you it's too late. Maybe at a doctor's appointment, you showed up and said, no, nah, you're too late. <laughs> I was at the um, Secretary of State, and the lady's appointment was at 9, and this was 10. And they're like, oh, your appointment was at 9. Sorry. Mm. How does that make you feel when it's I, you? I think she was pretty upset. Sometimes people get angry. Sometimes it makes you feel foolish. Very good. Yeah, a angry. And I think there'll be that too on the last day. I think because nobody wants to take responsibility for their own actions. But I think also it will be impressed upon you that the only person to blame now is you. Because the realization of who Jesus is and what he said and of truth and of justice is going to barrel down on you. But that's in our culture too, isn't it? It's not my fault. 
you're late, Mr. Pretz, now I can't let you in. But the traffic in my car and this and that and the other, is that their problem? I only gave myself five minutes when I should have given myself 20. Yeah. As uh, my best friend's uh, father said, uh, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, there's no excuse. So I, I think the hopelessness, uh, and, and I felt that too, because I've been late, too late for an appointment before this, this goes back. I, I've le I learned my lesson. <laughs> Did you but, miss it? Yeah, I was told I'm too late. Yeah, and it hurt. I mean, you feel, I felt embarrassed and guilty because you're kind of at the appointment desk. There was for a haircut and oh, everybody's okay. looking at you. And it was that's my I kind of your collar. Right? No, I was, yeah, no, I, I was actually shaving it really short at that time. I get, it's kind of like, man, if you're late to a doctor's appointment, how long often have you sat there for two, two hours. hours past your appointment time? Seems like it should be sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but then again, why did you have to wait so long? Because they fit people in that mm -hmm. couldn't be on time. And no. the other thing is too, if, if you're gonna compare it, there's a price to be paid for everything. And sometimes some of these doctors, they'll tag you for 25 or $30 if you're, in that. Oh. If you're considered a no-show, yeah. you get tagged. Well, that's $45. Well, they, fortunately, the doctors that I've missed appointments for don't do that. One time. We've, we've got a few minutes here, uh, and we actually have something in our enrichment magazine that talks about this parable. So uh, if you have it with you, uh, it's page 27. If not, I'm going to put it on the screen. says at the top, keep watch. And can I have a volunteer to read that first section down to foolish is as foolish does. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Are you ready? What do you think when you hear that question? Ready for Christmas? Ready for a party? Ready for an outing with family or friends? No less an authority than Jesus himself reminds us that we need to think about the question as we prepare for the most important event in anyone's future. Jesus is speaking of his second coming into the world. Indeed, Christ is coming. Are you ready? You did real good there, Tom. Why don't you read the next section down to the, the last full paragraph on the page? You don't mind. Our Lord often compares or compared his relationship with his church to that of a bridegroom and his bride. In one parable, he spoke of a wedding banquet prepared by a king for his son. On yet another occasion, Jesus spoke even more directly of himself as the bridegroom when he said, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? In Matthew 25, our Lord tells a story about 10 virgins, as in, excuse me, the Greek word is Parthenon, as in Parthenon, the famous temple in Athens, Greece. According to the custom of that time, these young women were waiting to attend a wedding Shortly after a couple's engagement was announced, the bridegroom would come, excuse me, the bridegroom would go to the bride's house, usually at night, and then take her back to his home to live. His friends would accompany him. The bride would be beautifully dressed for the occasion as she, with a few other of her best friends, awaited her future husband. As the happy couple walked through the streets, 
for the wedding banquet, other people would join in carrying oil lamps to help brighten this, enjoy, this joyous parade. Somebody else want to take over with that uh, paragraph in the bottom of 27 and then leading over into page 28. Jesus incorporates these customs into a story about his return to claim his bride, the Holy Christian Church. In our Lord's story, ten virgins, who might call them bridesmaids, waited near the bride's house so they could join the procession to the wedding feast. Five of these ten girls, says Jesus, were foolish. They had no oil to burn in their lamps, and obviously were not ready for the procession. They, of course, represent people who are not ready for the coming of Christ, the heavenly bridegroom. Somebody want to pick it up from there, or do you want to keep going, Karen? The Greek word translate, translated foolish is the word moros, from which we get the English word moron. People who are not ready for Jesus Christ's return at the end of the world are utterly foolish. No matter how many academic degrees they hold, or how many awards they have won. We have all probably met people who have gained tremendous amounts of earthly acclaim, but who have no time for God. We all probably know people who live strictly for today, for the pleasures of the moment. Jesus calls both groups of these people foolish, because whether they like it or not, tomorrow will come and they will not be ready. Good. Uh, Another volunteer to read on the next page, uh, if you wouldn't mind, up until where it says true wisdom and its source. To return to Jesus's parable, it's interesting to note that the foolish bridesmaid appear to be waiting for the bridegroom just as the wise girls are. Theologians might say that the foolish girls belong to the visible church, but in reality, they do not believe. They may worship every week and only every third or fourth, or only every third or fourth weekend. They may have Christian books on their bookshelves. They may even have read some of these. They may feel quite insulted if anyone presumes to question whether or not they consider themselves Christians. Still, the relationship with Jesus falls somewhere near the bottom of their list of priorities. And there's the difference. They have the books on the bookshelves and past. In fact, they've read them. Maybe they even attend Bible studies, but the fruit that's supposed to happen from that contact with God's word and from having a repentant heart isn't there. God is at the bottom of the priority list. I'll go if I have time, or I'll go because it makes me look good with my brothers and sisters in the faith if I'm there. But they're not doing it to honor their Lord and Savior. They're not doing it to keep their faith alive. Continue on there, Norma. You're doing just splendid. People like this fail to consider that human life is as fragile as a delicate crystal. So easily it shatters. A car wreck, an airplane crash, a sudden mysterious infection. Any one of a thousand different things could happen to any one of us this very day. Only the Lord knows if we will spend tomorrow afternoon here on earth or in eternity. Christ may return for us at the point of our own death or at the end of the world. It makes no difference. Either event could happen at any moment. The five foolish bridesmaids had not prepared. When Christ returns on a cloud of glory surrounded by thousands of angels, it will be too late for unbelievers to open their Bibles to find a faith they never had. And those who postpone repentance until they lie on their deathbed will likely learn a hard truth. If you had not thought about Christ for 40, 60, 80 years, your last thoughts will not be thoughts of Christ, but of terror. How tragic to arrive at heaven's gates and to hear the Lord say, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Yes, Christ is coming. Are you ready? Jesus contrasts the five foolish bridesmaids with the five wise ones. These girls had plenty of oil for their lamps and so could take part in the joyous procession. 
They are believers who know Christ, who treasure the relationship he made possible for us by his cross, who, uh, who await his return with holy joy. They are always ready for his return, kept in baptismal faith. And that's the important thing. You guys, whether you're actually thinking about Jesus is going to return or not, you're kept ready in baptismal faith. How do we get ready? Western culture seems nearly obsessed with sports. Cable channel after cable channel offers game after game. Professional athletes learn 10, 20, 30 times as much as our highest elected officials, 100, 200, 300 times as much as the average school teacher. In that kind of atmosphere, no team can expect to get anywhere by practicing one time before the national championships. Sports teams prepare daily. Professional athletes train even in the off season. How much more do we as Christ's bride want to prepare for his return? And I think about all of the people that attend this church regularly, and then over and above that, all the people that are on the rolls that I don't see, and I can't get a hold of, and never answer. What kind of dice are you throwing? Are you in faith? And those that attend regularly and don't come to Bible study, are you in Bible study during the week? Are you doing anything other than this hour and a half contact on Sunday morning? And I'm thankful you're getting that. But what if that's not enough? We do this by daily confessing our sins, asking God for forgiveness. We prepare by regularly reading the scriptures, which make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, from 2 Timothy. Every day we remind ourselves that our Savior could return at any moment. To sum it up, we are ready for Jesus' return when we live by faith in him as our Savior. The story is told of an elderly pastor who lay on his deathbed and was visited by his son, who was also a minister. The son stayed with his father for several days. As the weekend approached, the father said to the son, you better go back to your church and preach. If I slip away while you're gone, you'll know where to find me. You'll know where to find me. Because of Christ's cross, we can live every day in that confidence and that certainty. Final thoughts on what we've read and discussed today. Yes. How many of you have read or encountered this uh, parable before? You should have. I preached on it a year ago. <laughs> During the summer. But yeah, it's it in each that's once again the richness of God's word. I got more out of it preparing this time than I did that time. And I hope you did too. Hope it gave you some food for thought. And uh, I, I realized there was some heavy conviction in there, but not of you guys. You guys are doing exactly what you need to do to keep your lamps burning. And because your lamps are burning, you can at this point encourage other people to keep their reservoirs filled too. By your words and your actions. And those people that uh, are once a month, twice a month, or that go away up north and think that they can take time off from worship, you can invite them. I don't think it works too well to lay a heavy guilt trip on them, but uh, invite them. When they're up north, hey, is there a church near you? Just wondering if there's any churches you've ever visited. Or if you have the internet, look and see. Hey, I, I noticed that this uh, St. Timothy Lutheran Church is right near where you spend time at. You ever been there? I'm just wondering what it's like. <laughs> now, that's not too heavy, is it? To somebody? No, I haven't been there. And maybe they'll just dismiss you, but maybe they'll sit there and go to themselves. Wow, I actually could go there on a Sunday. Planting seeds. Yes. Winsomely. There is a time for, for a little bit more heavy-handed things. There is. Uh, but I think a, a winsome approach is uh, a lot better. And we all know those people. You can name off some names right now. And uh, God love them. I, I'm happy that when they come back home, they, they come to worship. But uh, it's an easy habit to get out of, as one of you said, Norma. That's what COVID-19 did. It uh, 
broke people of the habit of going on Sunday mornings. And I, what I've noticed is it's so darn easy when you're Zooming at home or you're Facebook Live at home, it's easy to get up and walk away. The last uh, pastor's conference we had at a regional conference um, was, on the, was on Zoom. And what I found is doing it in my office, here's all my work in front of me, and here's people at the door, and, and it, they're not always interesting, okay? And this one definitely was not. The keynote speaker didn't show up, and it was stuff I kind of heard before, and it didn't really impact me, and I wasn't really interested. So I turned my camera off and my sound off, and I actually worked on my sermon I had coming up because that was pressing. And after I broke and came back from lunch, I listened to uh, uh, President Meyer's uh, speech on the state of the district, and I didn't come back. I have better things to do. Now, if I'd been up there, even if it's kind of boring, you've got the brothers are there and there's activities there. It's just totally different to be there in person. And man, oh man, I got to believe that's true in worship as well. It's so easy to just tune out and walk away and not come back. Tom. We still have to, you know, we have to keep it in the forefront all the time especially to our brothers and sisters who have decided main or live streaming is the way to go. We're, we're denying ourselves the sacrament when we stay away from the congregation. But, but thankfully, we have some great people that make sure that live stream happens because it, it is good for people. There are people that physically can't come. And it's a blessing for them. And once again, we're, I'd rather have them streaming than not. Stay in contact with the church. Even if you could come and you're not, uh, I don't want to lay such a heavy guilt trip on them that they no longer want to come. And so I think I'm very thankful to have those dedicated uh, to making our live stream happen. And I wish I knew the name of some of them or could present some of them to you. <coughs> Hi, Joe. Hi. It's interesting that I've had a couple of people that do not belong to our church, you know, that are watching. Yes. And they wouldn't get it otherwise, you know. I know Rita, and I think there's some other members do this too, but Rita, she that, uses, what is it called? She, she actually posts it on her Facebook page so that people will see it on her Facebook page that aren't connected to the church and watch it. What's that called? You share. Yeah, she shares it. She shares the live stream, which is an awesome thing. And I know people from her family have tuned in and watched us, not because they came to our Facebook page, but they came through Rita. So something else y'all could do. I know Betty Smith, she'll stream while she's in the sanctuary because yes. I see her name pop up on the on the comments. And I know dang well she was in the sanctuary. <laughs> but you know, that, I, I don't mind so much if, if, if you do that and if you share it with people that aren't there. Share it on your Facebook page, even if you are here. What a great witness. Yeah, she sits in the back row and from where I sit, you can watch her phone as you're <laughs> doing <laughs> And I, I don't, I, I haven't seen a problem with speed, I think because they've increased our, uh, our signal. Uh, it used to be, we really didn't want people to do that. Well, back when we were doing the iPhone thing, when BG had the iPhone thing going, a couple people would sign on and use our internet and all of a sudden, bam, we're not streaming anymore. <laughs> we ran out of bandwidth. And then he brought in, uh, it was a separate uh, um, unit uh, that fed his phone. And that kind of solved the problem for a while. But I, I don't think we have a problem with that anymore. Because I think well, the, the streaming computer, that's, that's not Wi-Fi. That's hooked up directly into the internet. So it doesn't, doesn't affect that. Anyway, Jill, uh, thank you for all you do and, and the dedication you've had. And I hope that the time that you spent uh, is in live streaming hasn't made you blue as you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna rename her Smurfette. <laughs> it's a lovely blue, isn't it? It's a happy blue. You're, you're taking the color blue and it no longer is a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. Well, blue is my favorite color. That's mine too, I, I, I love blue. <laughs> Any final comments? Anything you wanted to say you didn't have time to? Y'all coming back next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. We got another fantastic parable. We got the parable of the talents.
Another one that's often misunderstood, and we'll dive into that next week, but now let's close with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for your encouragement to keep our lamps burning, to keep ourselves in a faith relationship with you. But thankfully, dear Jesus, it's not all up to us. You send your Holy Spirit. He's the one that works through the means of the grace to keep our lamps burning brightly. And when we let them go out at times by concentrating on other things, making other things in this world and in our life more important than you, you press the reset button. You do that through the law. You point out the ways we've let other things become more important than you. And in confession and absolution, we are reset so that you take your proper place in our life. Continue to do that, Lord, even though it sometimes hurts a little bit. Keep doing that. Keep us in faith towards you now and until the day that we leave this world to be with you in spirit or until the day you return and we gather together in eternal life. All this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully I'll see some of you guys uh, tonight for our NOAA Bible study. Maybe we won't experience another flood-like weather like we did two weeks ago. 